Yes, I do. Yes. How are you doing? Good. That was my uh, sister Millie. Why? Because you do what you get wrong. I don't remember that. Probably birth that you don't remember. <laughs> Okay, we're getting settled. That's a good thing. Grab some coffee and some creamer. There are fresh made store bought cookies, so they were baked with love by someone. And then they went home. Baked with love by someone at least 12 weeks ago. I don't know. That little little lady with the hat that does the Honey Bunch of Oats commercials. She, she baked those for us. Are you sure about that? I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. I hear Spoon is dropping. How are you doing? Jeremy's doctoring up his coffee. What do you got in there? Testament and bid adieu, we're just going to do a little bit of uh, rebuilding, remodeling, love it or list it here on the board. I'm, I can't go any further, sorry, as far as I can go. All right, can everyone see the board? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I like we're on a plane in case of an emergency. All right. I have on the side. Let me get out of here. This is silly. On the side, over here, if you can see, I got some numbers, some dates. And this kind of leads us to the end of the Old Testament as far as how we see it date wise. 537 BC, we're going back <coughs> to that time. That's the, you know, the, the, that's after the 70 years, roughly, when everyone was, remember, 70 years prior? Everyone was either, not everyone, but everybody who was exiled was sent into exile to Babylon and to Syria and things like that. And then later Persia uh, took over and there was a changing of the guard along those, those decades of exile. But do you remember who went off to exile 70 some years before that? Which of the people of Israel were kind of cherry picked to go into exile? Oh, people like Daniel. People like Daniel. Uh, everybody with a with names in the front end of the alphabet, like Daniel and Ezekiel, these and these. No, then you get shit under it down, so it wasn't necessarily where you were in the alphabet. But what was the criteria? Why those folks? Because they were nobles and possibly could be used for helping out their kingdom. Does anybody remember how exile worked back then as a method of war, nation building? Move them away from home so that they wouldn't be. Move them away from home. You pull them out of their land, and hopefully they just assimilate into your culture and your 
empire and would never be heard from again. And if you're going to take people and pull them out from another nation and make them part of yours, which of those people would you most likely want to have? The better ones. The better ones. So, you know, the leftovers were left behind in Jerusalem and in Judah. The cream of the crop, if you will, is taken off. So I don't know if you're in this time frame in Israelites' history, is that a good thing to be a leftover or isn't it? I mean, you know, who likes to be a leftover, right? So unless it's Thanksgiving dinner, that's kind of a nice thing. It's like being pig last for the team. Unless you're taking people out to be shot or going to exile, I don't know, maybe being a leftover is a good thing uh, sometimes. But these were kind of the leftovers the, the hoi polloi, uh, the, the political, the, the powerful, the beautiful, the prominent, the Hollywood, the New York types, they were taken and they were snatched out, the, the important ones. So 537 B.C. is the date when God says, okay, time's up. My land has gotten its 70 years of rest, which you all robbed it of because you never celebrated the year of Jubilee when you were supposed to. And giving the land is three and a half year Sabbath over the period of time that I gave you to do it, which roughly equates to 70 years that they robbed God's land of rest, which is why he partly sent them into, into exile. And you can read that as you walk through the earlier part of the Old Testament, how the, the year of Jubilee was supposed to be celebrated. It was supposed to be a, a year of repaying back all debts and letting go of all slaves, and you just wrote off all things that you had against one another, and you started fresh. In fact, you gave your land. You didn't even grow crops. You stored up, and you saved up, and you lived three and a half years of the Sabbath of just rest and relaxation. They never did that, apparently. God gets his rest. Seventy years. Seventy years of exile. Now it's time for the return. So Rubble and 50,000, that's the first wave. And then you got roughly a decades period here where you have Ezra coming in. And Ezra comes in and he begins to set the stage for the rebuilding of people's hearts. During this time, first of all, what was rebuilt? Remember, the temple was rebuilt during this time and then gradually. And how long did, did that happen right away? They got back and they got to work and it, yeah, and everybody went, woohoo, thanks for coming back, yeah, let's jump in. No, they met all this opposition. Why are you back? Where did you come from? We thought you were dead. What are you doing here? Show offs or whatever the attitude was. They did not want to rebuild the temple initially. Remember, it sat for a while, for a good number of years, and everybody else got on with their lives, and that's when... The Bible says you know, people are living in panel Haggai, living in panel houses, and the temple is in ruins. Come on, folks. And he kind of spurred them up. Haggai and Zechariah worked with Zerubbabel for 50,000, got the temple rebuilt. And then comes Ezra, and he's a scribe, and he's a priest, and he's a teacher, and he gets the people into the word. And then shortly after that, here comes Nehemiah. And remember, Nehemiah, he was forced to leave, right? The cupbearer for Artaxerxes. Remember, he was told, get out of here, you're a horrible guy. No, I don't remember who. How did, how did, how did Nehemiah get back to Jerusalem? Yeah. He asked to leave the exile, or rather the, the land. He asked to leave his kind of cushy, posh position to go back because his brother came and, and gave a report and said, man, things are really rough. Things aren't going so hot. And as really of that. Nehemiah's heart was kind of boiling over. He, he, had a, he had a fire in his belly to do something for the Lord, to be a leader. And so in 444 BC, we get the beginning and the continuation of the building of the city walls and the raising up and rebuilding of Jerusalem as a city and the people's livelihood and their culture and their society being rebuilt. That's kind of where we're at. Now, I want to focus on this guy today, as well as look a little at this, but then also a third leader in the prophet Malachi, as we end off the Old Testament. And I have as an 
acronym as we talk about Nehemiah and just this era of the Bible in general, and then also applying to us in the New Testament era, the word leader, and what it means to be a good leader. And that's where I'd like to kind of pick up our study today. I don't know who, if this is a, a who, who is a credited for coining the story, but there was a story about leadership um, that comes out of the French Revolution, uh, where, where a man was seen running down the city streets, and he was chasing after a group of soldiers, and somebody yelled out at him, why are you chasing those men? That's, that's my horrible French accent. Is it? <laughs> my ridiculous French accent. And, and he responds back, he says, I am their captain. I'm trying to see where I might lead them. And so the point is, yeah, if you're a leader, where do you got to be? <laughs> okay, was Nehemiah a front end or a back end leader? <coughs> he was a front end leader, but he comes around from the back end, kind of. So it's kind of interesting. So looking at Nehemiah, if you're going to be a leader, you got to lead from the front end. And in Nehemiah's case, in order to be that leader, of the people in Jerusalem who were kind of misguided and were overwhelmed by all this opposition, he has to lead where he's at. And a good leader leaves his comfort zone to take risks and follow the call. That's the first thing I see as part of leadership that I see from Nehemiah. Leaving your comfort zone, taking a risk, following the call. So, unlike a prophet, a priest, or a king, Nehemiah never really was officially anointed, I guess, as appointed. But did he receive a calling, nonetheless, from the Lord to do these things? How do you know that? Because he did them, right? Well, and were they blessed? He got the job. Secret Service for the president. You know, this was this was a high calling. This was a you know a high authority detail that he had. And he had you know he had personal you know, pass, and he was able to have permission to get into the king's presence. This, is, this was not just some show up at the door, you know, taking tickets at the nightclub. You know, this wasn't just some bouncer at a bar. This was a guy who had a high position, and along with that position came high trust, and along with that trust came high responsibility and authority, and high pay and respect, I believe. He was sitting pretty well. He leaves his comfort zone, he takes a risk, and he follows the call. So he, he does that. And when we look at you know, this, this idea of the cupbearer, this trusted servant, he goes back and he goes to, and he leaves Susa and he goes to Jerusalem uh, because he sees that this is a call that is bigger than himself. This is something that is for the Lord, not to be mistaken by his own interest, but this is a mission. He's on a mission from God. He's one of the first Blues brothers. And, and that's what he said I'm on a mission from God. And uh, I kind of thought we apply this to ourselves if we want to do an acronyms. Because they didn't have one. 
Now, where was he all this time as he's considering his big, holy, audacious goal? He's back in Susa. And what's he thinking about there? Once he heard, heard the problem, he was on his knees. On his knees and asking the Lord, what shall I do? And Lord, why is this happening? And, and he prayed and he fasted, we're told. And it says for a while. And then if you turn your pages in your Bible, it goes from one year in the, it seems like the Jews adopted the Aramaic calendar, because it goes from one year to the next year, and it, it mentions the month of Nisan, which seems like this was at least a period of about three months. So this wasn't the Lord um, putting this on, on Nehemiah's heart, and he sat down with his cup of coffee and penciled out about 15 good solid minutes to think about. Give this to the Lord for a good quarter of half an hour. For three months, it seemed like he just thought about this and prayed on it and pondered it. And I don't know. When it comes to big, holy, audacious goals, should you act too quickly? If you feel God is calling you to leave your comfort zone, asking you to take a risk and follow the call, is placed on you, whatever that is, in service to him. How soon is too soon? And how late is too late? Some of you have grown up in co worker families. Marsha, your dad is a pastor for how many years? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> been in a household when he received a call and he deliberated and considered? No. No? No, he didn't receive any calls while I was growing up. Okay. Lord, so what does that mean? God didn't have any big, holy, audacious no. goals for him? No, that's not what it means. No. Because the Lord wanted him where he wanted him to achieve the big, holy, audacious goal he gave him in that call, in that ministry, among those people in that place at that time. Has he received any sentence? Um, he went into retirement. Okay. So he served one place his whole ministry? No. Okay. But every time they moved, then they had a baby, and so they decided to stop oh. with me. Okay. So. <laughs> that's okay. Family planning. <laughs> that's okay. That's, not, that's part of God's big, holy, audacious goal. And maybe, and I, that's what I'm trying to get at. You don't have to be a called worker who receives a call by a body of believers, you know, in a quasi holy official way as you've been anointed for something in order to serve the Lord with a mission. Maybe your big, holy, audacious goal is you have a family and your calling is to raise that family in the name of Christ and your household will serve the Lord. And that's, that's audacious. That's a big goal. Sometimes that causes you to leave your comfort zone at times, to take risks, and to follow that call. So, as you do this, I see this is a, not trouble, but Nehemiah, 90 days or more in prayer, three months plus, he's really evaluating things. And a good leader sets a realistic assessment. Find out, you know, Nehemiah 2, 5 to 8, we hear about that kind of ideal and principle coming through. And I think that's really key. Because sometimes I might think God has a really big thing he wants me to do. And I just have to convince him of it. <laughs> and is that the same thing as leaving and evaluating? Lord, I really want to do this, and I'm going to come hook or crook, figure out a way for it to happen, and you're going to bless it. I'm going to support this, because I really think that's really where I'm at. And you chase after it, and you say, Lord, here's my agenda, and I'll bless it. But then it doesn't get blessed necessarily, because maybe God has a different plan for you, a different plan holy audacious goal for you to achieve and you're going yeah well I could see that in my life and I can see how that's kind of leading but that's not what I want those aren't the people I really want to be involved with that's not the kind of service I want to pursue I don't want to do that I want to do this 
Whose agenda is held to whose? Have you ever done that in life? Where you prayed to God and you've asked him to bless your prayer in the way you see fit? Have you ever had, had uh, closed a prayer with, oh, by the way, will be done? And you are I've done that. And I look at my life and go, why isn't it? And then over here, he got this whole thing going on, this whole circumstance, this whole, you know, event going, these things. And, and it's, it's like, there's these people and the stuff going on over here, and they're all like, yoo-hoo, hello. And you're all like, but Lord, I really wanted to do this. And over here is this screaming, faithful, you know, audacious God's really like there. <coughs> I am. And as I remember when we went through the vision thing, so the strength of our vision, you know, your past experiences are part of who you are. Your passion, your interest, yes, that's part of that. But then also looking at where you're at right at the moment and how God has gifted you today to see how that can be part of finding your soul or the healing your vision or the call. And so in Nehemiah 2, 5 to 8, he seeks the king's approval. He seeks the king's documentation to get the, you know, the passport for his travel stamped before he leaves and moves back to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah waited for the proper documentation. He waited for the proper steps to be taken. And then when he gets to Jerusalem, he walks around. If you remember, he goes and he surveys the city under the cover of dark to kind of see what was going on, to get a first-hand assessment of what really was happening, is what he was told, really what had been taking place. Because you remember, if he would have walked around in the light of day, went around with his surveyor team and started to lay out the stakes and bring in the excavation team. And, and you could see for a mile and a half they're building a subdivision over there in the broad daylight. If you don't want that up there, you're going to come bold in the day of light. And you're going to come in the light of day and you're going to bring up all your opposition and resistance. And so he tries to figure out a way to work around his opposition. He assesses it. And then he formulates a plan as to how to address the naysayers. And, and remember, this is now, if you put it in perspective, it's been, I think, there, not quite 90, put it over there. I put that there. 93 years, roughly, since the walls of Jerusalem had been laid waste. When you look at the overall spectrum of the exile and things that almost a hundred years of this being in this condition and this state. And now uh, Nehemiah is coming in and he's going to change it overnight. He's going to change 90 years of history plus overnight. And he's going to do it with a group of people who are. You're coming in and wanting to, we've gotten used to the fact that we're defeated. We've gotten used to the fact that God bailed on us. We've gotten used to the fact that we're exiled and we were the leftovers or whatever. And now you want to come in and you want to change everything? Because human beings love change, right? One of the things, we're, we just embrace change. We wake up in the morning and go, what, Lord, can you turn upside down and shake out, turn everything topsy-turvy so that I can go, huh? Because that's really, when I put my feet on the floor, that's my first thing I ask God to do is turn everything upside down today. Who likes change? But do we need change? We need change. Who likes, you like, Carol, no. No change. <laughs> Status quo is good. Um, so in order to make change, you have to understand how. And, and is there a principle here that Paul lays out in his encouragement about change? Remember what he said about making decisions? He said two things you have to balance out. Permissible versus what? Just because I can, it doesn't necessarily mean I always should. 
just because all, th all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Have you ever been in that situation where you thought, of course this is what I should do, this is the decision, this is the course of action, and just because you can, you automatically should. Or is God saying, reevaluate? Before you take a step, reevaluate where you're stepping. Want me to guide you and bless you? Make sure your steps are in line with my will. Back up, look at the bigger picture. And then, when you get a clear idea, <clears throat> take your action. A leader, she or he motivates by identifying with him or herself in the context of those they're leading. You, you, you motivate by identifying. By, yeah, I'm, I'm with you in this. And, and you identify where you're going in relation to where you feel you need to be stepping. And paralysis by analysis. If you don't identify the actions that you need to take based on evaluation and the, the idea of moving towards something, evaluating where you're headed, and then if you get this great big plan of what you're going to do, but then you never act on it, what happens? You're going to build a house. You got the blueprints drawn up. <laughs> and instead of going and finding an architect to, to help you further, maybe because you've got an architect, you got the blueprint, but you don't ever find a builder. You just keep adding on to the plan. Well, maybe we should put a dormer over here and add on a three car garage here. Well, you know, one day our parents might want to move in. Let's, maybe we should. And then what if we get what if we get a border collie? Should we have this? Kind of, well, what if we get pugs? Well, maybe we need to have this kind of. You know, or if, what happens if you never finally act on your plan? Doesn't get done. It just becomes a dream that is unfulfilled. That's the whole paralysis by analysis you know, cycle. It just keep focusing on it and adding to it and reevaluating, but. You never really finally do it. What what motivates that? What's what's behind that? Fear, maybe fear. Fear that maybe I really didn't do these things properly, or fear of you know the unknown, the change. I don't want to do this because it's comfortable to just talk about it. The ideal of stuff is so much better than the reality of stuff. You ever had that idea where you know, this seemed like a really great idea? I'd really like to plan a vacation too. And I can picture myself there. And it's so perfect. But then you start planning, you realize the hassle that comes with planning for that bucket list trip or whatever. And then what if it doesn't happen that way? Your unrealistic ideals don't match the realities. What if you know, what if the flight gets canceled or the hotel catches on fire or the weather comes? wipes out the beach. Sometimes, you know what? Never try, never fail. Some people think. But then, every shot you've never taken, you've always missed. So where do you balance yourself in your Christian walk with the plans, the ideals that God has for you? Sometimes you just have to When you've done all the work, what comes where you finally have to make a decision? And that's where the D in leadership comes in. I see this in Nehemiah, the discernment. I mean, he, he was facing some godless tactics. There were people out there who were mocking them, who were ridiculing them, and they were using math, weapons of mass deception where they were trying to undermine and ruin the reputation of the project, that there were all these naysayers who did not want to, for whatever reason, rebuild the city or the temple. And that seems like a no-brainer, right? If you're the people of Israel, this is part of your, this is part of your calling. And there were a bunch of people who were just against it, and they tried to use the tactic of misdirection. We'll talk with him. Nehemiah, come out to Laredo. Yeah. Laredo, Texas is famous for ambushes. And that's kind of what was happening. They were calling Nehemiah to come out and talk with us about your building plans. 
all on your own, by yourself. And we'll discuss your ideas. He didn't do that. He wasn't that, he was discerning. He wasn't that dumb. So is discernment just not being dumb? Knowing the difference between what? I could do it. <laughs> is that wise? I could do this, but is that wise? I just received a windfall from my parents, for example, or whatever, a windfall of money uh, and some sort of inheritance. Or, you know what? I think the Lord's calling me to open up a Christian home. Dogs for God. I don't know. <laughs> you come up with the idea. Maybe that's a great idea. Dogs for God. You know, cars for kids. I still there's one of those in Wisconsin. You know, it was Bart Starr that started that one. It's cars for kids. Just the name kind of creeps me out. Cars for kids. I think it sounds like they want to donate cars for kids to drive. But no, the thing was, you donate your old cars to this organization that takes care of needy children in adoption centers and in foster homes and things like that. So the name kind of sounds a little, and who would come up with that idea, right? I want to get a bunch of cars donated, and I'm going to give them to kids. So they can, so they can be mobile. No, that's a bad idea. That would be a bad idea. Dogs for God? I don't know. That's Maybe, maybe you could work on that one. Maybe that's your big dream. Maybe that's your big, hairy, holy, audacious goal that God has. Or maybe not. Be careful. Follow through. Be realistic. Uh, don't get caught off of practicing discernment, which is don't be dumb. I, I like that, Ava. Don't be dumb. <laughs> Nehemiah was not dumb in his understanding. <laughs> of his role as a leader. He had discernment. And, you know, that, that discernment, it, it helped because this mockery escalated into actual attacks. And he was smart about understanding people and asking God for guidance and helping to discern the underlying motivations behind people's hearts. And, and, and you, know, you know what you have to do when you decide something. is simply to just finally make a choice. You have to decide. You have to choose one or the other and cut down the middle and say yes to something and no to something else. That's part of decision. That's part of the discernment that God gives us. And knowing you know, what's going on, after the, you know, the walls were finished, there was a, a lot of bad intention by Tobiah, and then there were other attempts at the work to fail, and you had that false prophet. And to come on out to, to, the, to the plain of Ono. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Sounds like the right. You know, and, and there's potential harm there. And, and, you know, he didn't follow through. He had enough common sense. And he didn't, you know, just listen to the false insider information in the bubble belt of Jerusalem there. He didn't listen to the false prophet of Shammaiah. Uh, he didn't listen to the inside information in the group think he, he, he practiced discernment. Anybody got any questions on discernment or comments? Because I think that's a big one. How many of you feel you have the gift of discernment? <laughs> Anybody got the, you know, the spirit of discernment, Terry? Or do you just step in? <laughs> um, where does that discernment come from? Where do, where do you get your strength to make the right decisions? Well, a lot of times the right decision comes down to deciding two really good things. Does that make sense? Okay. The, the, the sermon, first of all, where does it come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit's, I'm going to call it his sanctified common sense that he, you know, infuses within us as we read his word and understand God's principles for life. And we use our life experience, we use who he has made us to be, personality, passion-wise. Do I know myself, really? Or am I just trying to do something to prove myself 
you know, that, see, I'm going to use an example I'm going to go back to. Say for, because this is my world, maybe this will help with your world, but a call to ministry as a pastor. Who knows? The phone could ring this afternoon and I could get a call from another church or organization asking me to do something. To come serve them in some way or capacity. Now, first thing. Is one bad and one good? No. And I want you to look at it, and this is kind of corny, but this is how he used it. And he was such a Mr. Rogers, kind of just such a wonderful guy. And he has and he, two beautiful apples. You got these two beautiful apples God's giving you. And he's asking you to pick one. And whichever one you pick, he promises to bless, because he brought them both to you. But he loves you and trusts you enough to use this kind of stuff to make the decision. And he will trust you and love you enough to actually have you wrestle in it and make the decision. And he honors you that way. Two beautiful apples. I use pumpkin bill, I don't know why. To <laughs> name some of the use and use the So, some people go, well, that's a bad call. Who wants to have a pumpkin bill in Michigan? But going to you know, Boise, Idaho. No, 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 we're talking. <laughs> yeah, Foothill, living a good life. And, you know, and, you know, congregation is great. And everything's super duper. And so which is which is a good one? Which is a bad one? In my stupidity, I, I don't go through these steps properly, and I end up going. Oh, of course, the one that naturally attracts me and seems desirous to me is the. If you're in that position, what do you need to decide? And how do you make that decision? What do you need to evaluate? If you are being called from one area to another area, literally and figuratively, you know, maybe asking to expand on skills you didn't think you had, or being challenged to develop gifts that you weren't sure you were given, how do you? Or do you approach it with, oh, of course, I'm talented and gifted. Otherwise, God wouldn't have asked me. Of course, I'll pick the better, the more popular. Wow. Well, as part of your decision-making process, I'm certain that in that moment, you're, you're thinking, what's best for the kingdom overall? You, you, you try to take the personal, what's best for me, and turn it into what's best for we. And I'm upside down. Yeah. And so, what is the, best for me? The personal know? piece of it, though, is something that how do you separate yourself from that? I mean, you've received calls. And what, what's your part of that process? The, the me part versus the we part? Yeah. Um, well, first thing I do is I look at the <laughs> No, I'm <laughs> I check the crime rate and I look at the housing. And, and no, I'm, I'm teasing. That's not at all. That's mm -hmm. kind of way down when you finally what are you asking me to do to serve them in the name of Christ. And do I feel I have the gifts and abilities to do that for them? <coughs> are they asking me to do things that might challenge me to think and grow? And are they going to encourage me in that? And are we you know, is there going to be this remember what Paul calls the gospel ministry? He calls it a joyful and I look at that contract agreement. What can I do to be a source of joy to you? And what in turn are you going to be able to do to be a source of joy to me as we encourage one another in gospel ministry? And you take the competitiveness. You know, first thing I know a lot of guys look to, they go back and they, well, who served there beforehand? And then as they're delivering, they'll call them up and ask, well, how did it go? So, yeah, I don't, I personally don't like doing that. Never have, except for one time when I knew that the guy that was there before me was living right next door to the church. And he had just retired. It was kind of not a real happy situation. So I did call him just to get his feel on things, because I... I did not want to walk in a situation where I felt like I was still stealing something away from somebody else. And he was the retired.
retired pastor still living, you know, a stone's throw from us, right there, very active in the congregation. I want to be very careful about that. I don't want to give any misimpressions. So I wanted to talk about, you know, are you okay if I were to come? How would this work? You know, and that that was one exception. But you know, I usually don't think about the personality. Maybe I should. I don't know. Um, personalities. I always look at what is the objective they want. To, what what is it that's going to take the take me? How can I take me and partner with you to be we together in joyful partnership of gospel ministry? Do I have the gifts that you're looking for, and you have the needs that I can help meet? And those those are the you know, the opportunities, the channel, you know, the SWAT, you know, strings, weakens, options, threats. You look at all that stuff. And you, you listen to a lot of people talk to you, and sometimes they say exactly what you want to hear. Because, you know, churches are, when they're, when they're without a pastor or somebody to fill a position, a school or, or another organization, you really want somebody in there. Sometimes we might push and sell it a little bit. But, you know, oh, yeah, this is super. Oh, don't worry about that. You know, a question. Because I get it. People want somebody to come. They're, they're really wanting you to come and serve. Sometimes you have to ask the hard questions. Sometimes you have to ask the hard questions. Okay, what would be like if? And then you can give a scenario and, and throw that back. So, I, again, there's no easy answer to this. But at the end of the day, Bob, you got to come down to, I got you know, these two shiny you know, little apples. Which one do I choose? I've heard that from immature, inexperienced candidates called in the ministry. Oh, did you get a good call or a bad call? And it's always based on location or district. Or it's both beautiful gifts from God serving his people. Nehemiah did that. He discerned what can God use me to accomplish. And one of his greatest assets was that of encourager. And I think that's one of the greatest assets, Bob, I try to... What is the role of a pastor? This is not encourager. To encourage your team. Your team. We're on the same team. We're not enemies, right? We're on the same team. And along with that comes respect. And Nehemiah constantly praying for the people. Asking for God's guidance and his administrative leadership and partnering with Ezra and Malachi. And he always sought respect. Respect of God, respect for the king, and respect for the team. And I think as we, as Christians, look at life, God, authorities, and subordinates. How many of you respect your authorities? How many of you feel as a as an independent autonomous American, you are called by God to listen to your president, whether you, he's your president or not, and whether you voted for him or not. How many of you feel that you at least owe him respect to the office? Whether you agree necessarily with his policy, his leadership style, his personality, his history, even, even, even which side of the aisle he may be on, you at least owe him respect to the office. How do, you, how do you express that respect for your president? Pray. Pray. How many of us pray for the presidents we don't like? I don't know what you pray for. That's up to you and God. <laughs> but do you do it? Did Nehemiah not pray for the authorities? Did he not ask God to watch over all those involved, including the, the one to whom he served his father? Yeah. Did he not pray for his team? fellow members, from the fellow people on the building, right? And, and you notice, his, 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 his plan was, some of you build, some of you stand a post, and then you switch. And some of you watch guard, and some of you do the work. And he had a plan, and he had a plan that he delegated and administrated, but he had a plan of action. And it built team. They were doing this together. He removed all the obstacles of fear 
and he allowed them to accentuate their gifts as a team. They would not have gotten the city walls built if there were not those people <coughs> watching the post and looking out for those that were trying to come and undermine their work. They would not have gotten it accomplished if there weren't people dedicated to doing the work under which the, the soldiers were providing the protection. So it was really important that they had this idea of encouragement and respect. God authorities and subordinates, God king and team, God government and you and me. That, that's our place as Christians, wherever God has put us in leadership. And so to your question, Bob, it does come back to you, and this sounds like a... <laughs> it does come back to big K kingdom. And I cannot confuse that with my understanding or version of the kingdom. Because sometimes my idea of what is really best for the kingdom of God may not be at all what God has in store. And I've seen that quite often my own ministry with others they come into a situation thinking I got this sized up I know exactly where God is leading us to go and it gives you a completely different direction focus and passion and obstacles as well as opportunities and he leads us as he would have us serve him but at the same time I have to make a decision I have to act I have to trust God no matter where it is in life whether it's what am I going to do with my tax refund? To what are we going to do with a building project at church or not? Big K Kingdom. Am I going to take my tax refund? Am I going to just spend it on me? Or am I going to take a portion of that first fruit and joyfully and proportionately set it aside and give it to the support of His? And that, that's what Malachi really brought to the table. The idea of not bringing the leftovers. Remember, he, he, he's got that complaint. Remember what kind of offerings the people brought? Yeah. Blind. Blind. They formed the left. Eye was missing. And they had the, you know, scurvy and you know, whatever that skin disease animals get. Mange. The mange. Yeah. By bringing mangy old, you know, one-eyed sheep to the offering. And he says, don't do that. Bring out your best. Give your best. Because who's always given his best for you? I can only give my best out of the God who gives his best. And when I look at all of that in relation to this, I pray that God guides you, helps you. You know what it means to be a leader in your own right? My remedy in all this is Christ, who gives himself constantly. And how can I not but honor him in bringing my best to him? And that way, we're blessed. So let's have a prayer. I hear kids coming down the hallway. <clears throat> Lord God, I thank you for the leadership you've given to, to your body of believers, from the prophets to the apostles, to pastors, teachers today. You've given some that you might have them lead us, that prepare and equip us for works of service so that your body might be built up. Whether it was a Nehemiah long ago, an Ezra, a Malachi, whether it's people today, moms and dads, husbands and wives in public ministry, just each of us as part of the body of believers, as, as people who belong to the Holy Christian Church, help us to truly know what it means to lead know that you are with us, that you will bless our efforts, help us to make decisions that are truly blessed by your guidance, and that we might be committed and, and content in how you lead us to decisions. Above all, help us to encourage each other. When we're confused, indecisive, or don't know what to say or do, help us know we have people right here with whom we can talk and for whom we can pray. Bless us, Lord, as we are built up the walls of our hearts and lives on the foundation of friend and savior by the message of the gospel. In your name we ask this. Amen. Oh, how are you doing, Daddy? Fine. How was your uh, anniversary day?
Good morning, everyone. Welcome in Jesus' name today. We gather as one body to give praise to our Savior, one Lord, one hope, one truth and promise. Our Savior reigns, and that is our great comfort and hope. And, and as we, we talk about that, um, sometimes we think God ought to do things in a, a faster way than he does. Have you ever been there? Or Lord, hurry up and can you bless me now? Can you answer that prayer now? Can you get me moving past this struggle or trial? 